Hello, take a look at this photo. This is a photo that I have shared right here on YouTube on my community feed recently. This is a 180 degrees panorama of the entire Milky Way arc. I know, it looks pretty awesome. And I shot this using my beloved Skywatcher Star Adventure and I know that some of you have been asking me on how to pull off such a photo using a star tracker and apparently there is nobody on YouTube talking about this subject at least at the time of me recording this video. So guess what? You are in here for a treat because this is exactly what we are going to discuss today. Okay, let's get started. Before we begin, I just wanted to say that this is actually a part one of two parts about this subject. I have decided to split this video in half because I don't want to produce one video that will be like 30 minutes long because that would be just too overwhelming and besides, it can be logically split because part one that you are watching right now is going to be about the equipment that you will need and about the shooting technique that you need to employ in order to make sure that you have the right images to work in post-production and then part two will be all about post-production and what you will need to actually do in order to come up with the final photo because the post-production is a little bit complicated as well. So let's start with the equipment. Okay, so at first let me quickly cover how would you approach shooting a panorama using a just a regular tripod and a camera without any star tracker. So normally what is recommended to do is to level your tripod. If you level your tripod then you will be able to rotate the ball head using only this control right here on the back. So you don't actually need to use the ball itself on the ball head. You can just rotate it around and that way you can make a panorama sweep like this with consistent frames and you take a couple of frames every couple of degrees of angular you know changes in the azimuth one shot second shot third shot etc how many wish you like and if you make them overlap at each other then software like adobe lightroom will be able to stitch them together into a final panorama so you just mount your camera like this if the tripod is level, and this is important because if the tripod is not level, then this plane of rotation here will be off angle with regards to the horizon. So my tripod is already level. I can just tighten this like this. I can use the bolt head in order to actually set the framing that I want. And then I can use just this screw right here and I can take a shot, rotate, take a shot, rotate, take a shot, rotate. And that way I shoot those individual photos that I then merge together into a final panorama. But if you're using a star tracker, that we run into a very important issue. And let me quickly change this to the star tracker. So let's try this. Wow, that worked. All right, so now that we have a tracker, the problem is that we have this angle right here. And if we were to rotate our ball head, then we are rotating at this angle and this angle, this plane of rotation is not parallel to the horizon. So we cannot just simply rotate it around like this in order to complete our panorama. And you could do that if you were on like the north or south celestial pole because that way the tracker would be pointed straight up into the sky and that way this would be actually level. But chances are you're not on the south or north celestial pole. So if you're pretty much anywhere else on earth, you would run into this very issue. And the way that I solve this is to actually use a second ball head and this is uh, this is the same ball head this is the Benro IB0 I can highly recommend this ball head if you want to pick it up the link will be down below in the description along with links to any of this stuff like tracker cameras or whatever so we have a ball head like this and the cool thing about this ball head is that it actually has a bubble level right here on this platform on the quick release plate so you can actually use this ball head that is right here on this quick release on this ball head right here and make sure that this is actually level with regards to the horizon and then we can mount the second ball head right here and then on top of that we can mount our camera so let's quickly do that in order to mount it here i need to actually use one of these quarter inch to three eighths of an inch adapters this little screw right here i can just screw it in and then i can use this quick release to mount this onto the second ball head just like that and then I can mount the second ball head right here. Maybe we can actually put it down a bit. Yeah, that's better. And then you can use the second ball head in order to unlock again this uh, axis of rotation. Unlock this and then you can do your panorama sweep just like that with this 
plane of rotation being parallel to the horizon, which is exactly what we wanted. And you may say, okay, I could probably do that with one ball head by managing this rotation and also the ball position, but that way it is really hard to get consistent frames. And if you have consistent frames with not very much rotation between them, the software that you will be using in post-production will have much easier job to do to actually complete the task of stitching the panorama. So that's why it's highly recommended. And also it's pretty hard to see actually at night how do you change your framing if you want to ensure the overlap. It is really handy to have this angular scale right here so you can make sure that you are rotating by the same exact angle each time so you can figure out how much do you want to rotate just once at the beginning and then just use that and use this angle of rotation in order to make sure that the changes in position are consistent between each individual frame. Okay so now let's discuss what kind of focal length would you even need and what kind of difference does it make if you are doing this early in the Milky Way season versus late in the Milky Way season because there is a substantial difference. The Milky Way season is basically the time of year, the range of months in a given year that you can shoot the Milky Way, the core of the Milky Way which is above the horizon on the dark night part of the night and the Milky Way season starts when the core of the Milky Way starts to be visible above the horizon right before the dawn and then the Milky Way season ends when the core of the Milky Way sets before the dark night starts. So at the beginning of the season the Milky Way looks diagonally like this and it rises and then you have morning. But then at the end of the Milky Way season when the dark night starts the Milky Way is already pretty much straight up and then it quickly sets below the horizon. That's the end of the Milky Way season. So the point is that in the beginning of the Milky Way season which on the northern hemisphere is around February, March maybe depending on your latitude, the Milky Way shots that you will get the Milky Way will be diagonal with regards to the horizon. And then late in the Milky Way season which on the northern hemisphere at least on my latitude is around September or maybe even October the Milky Way will be pretty much straight up into the sky. So what it means is at the beginning of the Milky Way season the arc that the Milky Way will be crossing across the sky is going to be smaller. It's going to be a smaller difference in the azimuth between the start of the Milky Way and the end of the Milky Way and also it will be rising lower above the horizon. So you have much less ground to cover in your panorama if you want to cover the entire arc and thus you can probably get away with a focal length of like 24 millimeters or something like this on a full frame you don't need to be super ultra wide in order to capture that you will probably have no problem capturing the entire arc in one horizontal sweep of panorama shots but the problem is that at the late season of the Milky Way which by the way was exactly when I was shooting the photo that I have shown you in the intro I was shooting this in September so Milky Way was pretty much straight up into the sky and I was actually worried if I will be able to capture it using just one row of panoramas and you typically want to use one row of panoramas because if you don't and you have a second row up into the sky in order to capture the entire arc then you're gonna have exposures without any ground in the exposure and the software the stitching software will have much harder time stitching that together so early in the season no problem but late in the season I would recommend to use something like a 15 maybe 14 millimeters on a full frame something very very wide I was using this Laowa 15 millimeters f4 macro shift lens which is a very funny lens manual focus uh, it has a lot of cool characteristics but the point is that it was shot with a 15 millimeter focal length and I was barely able to get the entire arc when I was doing my sweep and here is a pro tip in order to make sure that you can fit as much as possible in the vertical space so instead of just taking the camera and putting it on like this hang on I need to put it a little bit further down so you can see that okay that's better so instead of doing it like this with the camera being horizontally and doing the panorama sweep like this instead what you can do is put it on the side and use it in the portrait mode and that way let me tighten this and that way you can use the ball head to get your sort of tilt angle correctly you know tilt changes now with the ball and then if I tighten this I can just use this control of this rotation of the ball head in order to make my sweep so 
I'm using individual shots that are in portrait mode and that way I can make sure that I pack as much of the vertical space as possible. You want to shoot with a little bit of ground at the bottom and then as much high into the sky as possible, hopefully capturing the entire Milky Way arc in one sweep. And if you want to see if you actually are capturing the Milky Way, because typically if you shoot around the core, you will probably have no problem identifying that you have the Milky Way in the shot. But if you're shooting other parts of the Milky Way that are much dimmer, you probably might have hard time discerning on the back of the camera if you have the Milky Way in your shot or not. So the pro tip right here is to use a custom color profile in your camera. You can set custom color profiles and on this custom color profile you can crank up the contrast as high as possible and that way the preview on the back of the camera will be much more contrasty so you will be able to tell if you actually have the Milky Way in the shot throughout the entire sweep of the panorama individual shots but at the same time the raw photos that you actually are recording on the SD are untouched by this color profile setting. The color profile does not affect the raw photo so you'll have the same exact capabilities in raw and post-production but on the back of the camera you will see a much contrasty photo and by the way if you're shooting raw plus JPEG then the JPEG will be affected by the color profile but the raw will not. So here's a little pro tip for you and also if you want to see how much do you actually need to rotate because it is normally recommended to like overlap it by one third of a frame in order to get a good result in post-production. So if you want to see how much are you rotating because at the back of the camera everything will be pretty much dark and you won't be able to see much. Maybe use some bright planets like Mars or Jupiter but if there's nothing like this on the sky on a particular night you can use just the ground for the reference point but the ground is also pretty dark so what you can do is you can just use a flashlight. This is uh, something that I got uh, when I got my tracker. It was <laughs> in the package courtesy of B&H photo. Thank you B&H. You can just use this flashlight in order to shine on the ground in live view in order to see what portion of the ground you are actually having in your frame and that way you will be able to tell how much do you need to rotate and then you can remember on this angular scale how much did you rotate and rotate by the exact same angle every single time. So now that you actually start taking your shots if you turn on the tracker the tracker will starts to rotate just like that. So the plane of rotation will actually quickly become off angle with regards to the horizon, but that's not a problem. If you're doing like a one exposure per framing, this is not going to be much of a difference. And the more important fact is that you will have, you know, consistent framing across your sky because then the ground doesn't really matter. You will need to blend in the portion of the ground from a set of different exposures anyway. So just don't worry about that. And then once it's complete and if you need to do another row of photos because if you actually cannot capture the entire Milky Way arc given your focal length and given the season of the Milky Way it is actually possible to still pull off a photo like this but you will just need to tilt up the camera just like that and then do another row of photos and that way you can stitch both rows together in order to get the entire arc in the final photo. And then maybe if you are starting a second sweep of panorama photos, maybe it's a good idea to actually reset the position of the right ascension axis. So what you can do is just loosen the clutch, get it back into the position, tighten it again, the tracking can be on for the entire time and then do another sweep. And that way you will ensure that you actually have the entire Milky Way captured in all of those individual frames. And now the tricky part is the ground because the ground of course is going to be blurry because you're using a tracker, you're tracking the sky and the ground is blurry. So we need to blend in the ground and for that typically you just turn off the tracker and take an exposure of the ground. The ground will be sharp, the sky will be blurry and that way you can blend them together in photo and about the blending process I already have two videos so definitely I can highly recommend them you can check them out right here but what you can actually do is to take less exposures overall you can actually go to the horizontal mode and this is exactly what I did for this photo that uh, I was showing you before you can go to the horizontal mode and then do one more sweep across the same kind of range of azimuth that you shot capturing the arc do that with the tracker turned off to capture the ground and then you can blend it in in post-production and then if you actually want to include your actual self or maybe some other subject into your frame like on a photo I showed you there was my humble self in the frame what you can do is take a one separate exposure with your subject in the frame you can light your subject again I was just using this tiny flashlight somewhere on my chair 
to light me up for this for this photo and then you the where you will have the flexibility of actually choosing in post-production whether you want to include this shot with your subject or maybe you just want playing clear ground without the subject because sometimes it looks better with the subject sometimes without the subject and that way if you have shots like this you will be able to in post-production decide if you want to include the subject or not. Alright, that's pretty much all the preparations and all of the tips when it comes to equipment and shooting techniques that you need to do in order to get the exact materials, the exact raw photos that you will need in post-production in order to create a final Milky Way arc panorama. And like I mentioned, the post-production process is going to be covered in detail in part 2 of this video, so make sure you stick around if you haven't subscribed already, subscribe to my channel and maybe also ring the bell so you get notified because post-production with images like this is not that easy. Lightroom will not be able to stitch a panorama like this, you will actually need to use some other piece of software and that way I will be dedicating an entire video to that process so at the end of that video we will arrive at my final photo that I showed you in the beginning so make sure to stay tuned for that and in the meantime give this video a like if you like this I would really appreciate that comment down below if you have any questions and you can check out these two videos they might be interesting to you as well remember to subscribe and see you next time bye bye